Thank you all for being here. Appreciate uh, your, your presence. Um, if you're visiting with us and this is your first time here, um, don't base your probability of return on me. I am not the guy. I'm just a dude. Um, we have a unique thing here at Southside where a lot of men are, are very, um, aside from me, very talented to get up and, and, and preach lessons. We have this meeting with a bunch of, of different men, and then in the summertime we'll have another uh, gospel meeting with a completely different set of men. So it's very encouraging. There, there are men here who hold gospel meetings, fill in elsewhere. So it's, it's, it's an awesome thing that we have here, and uh, not, not to boast about that. I'll glory to God first and foremost for sure, but uh, it's, it's pretty cool that we have that. Thankful for this opportunity to, to stand here before you, the elders, given this opportunity for, for all of us. Appreciate Tim leading the songs, Aiden the scripture reading, uh, Tara putting this template together for, for all of us to kind of have some uniformity with our lessons, and um, uh, hopefully we'll gain something from, from, all, from all being here. So I asked this question to myself the, the other day, are, uh, are leaders born or made? You ever heard that term, he's a natural-born leader, they're a natural-born leader? <clears throat> I read a recent article stated that according to your research by psychologists, leaders are mostly made. The best estimate offered by research is that leadership is about one-third born and about two-thirds made. That, that to expect a person to be born fully rounded, a complete leader with the ability to influence and direct their team, just didn't make a whole lot of sense according to, to group dynamics. This is really good news for anyone who's trying to get a degree in leadership development. That's, that's awesome for you. But back to the one-third. Some folks are just born with the characteristics to lead, right? In the athletic world, sometimes genes just win or lose. It's just the way it is. Sometimes you'll find athletes who are just freaks. The Usain Bolts, the Rich Fronins, the Marius Pujanowskis, the, the, the Thor, the guy who plays the mountain on a, on, a, on a show. Some people are just... No matter how much you train, you train, you train, you're just, you're just going to have that genetic edge. Our kids at random times will say, I hope I get this tall. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I hope you do too. Um, Luke and Allie say it a lot more, more so than me. I think me is just a part <laughs> destined to the fact, look, I'm going to be short. It's just the way it is. Two, two of, uh, three of my best friends from high school are all 6'2 or better. So anytime we go to breakfast or we eat together, it's just it's like one of those skits from Sesame Street, right? And one of these things just doesn't belong here. <laughs> but we're just, we're kind of at the shadow end of the, the gene pool, height gene pool. So sorry, kids. But if it's, if it's true that uh, some people are born with genes that just make them more athletically superior, then the same can be said for, for leaders, right? Some people just have that edge. But for us, just a real quick, Real quick, five points why well, leaders are, are made and not born. Sometimes you're just put into position to lead. If you're an introvert and, and you don't really have a lot of average social intelligence or maybe you're just not particularly empathetic, does that mean you're not going to make a good leader? No, not at all. I don't, I don't know anybody who would be born with the capability to know how to do something during a mass shooting or some type of tragic event like that. Sometimes you're just thrust in positions where you have to lead. Doing the right thing to be successful, all leaders, no matter what their leadership style, top or so on, must choose the right action at the right time. They gotta be courageous, self-aware, and ensure the consistent support of their team of followers. This is a skill which needs to be practiced over and over again. Introvert or extrovert, this, this is a choice, like anything else, like do you want to be a leader? If you want to, then, be, then lead, be a leader. Whether you're an introvert, we have some of those where you're a situational introvert, hello, or a situational extrovert, again, me, or just a complete extrovert, uh, you can be a leader, no matter, no matter what type of person you are. Leading by example, not much to expand on there, only to add this may, this may be considered a natural born quality, but knowing what to do in some situations can only come from experiences. Leaders never stop learning, never stop leading. True leaders ensure that they continue to develop their leadership skills throughout their careers, through learning and development and other opportunities. <clears throat> when the time came for someone to succeed Moses, the leader of the children of Israel, a man by the name of Joshua was chosen. And I asked this question as I was kind of digging into this. Was Joshua a natural-born leader? 
or is it something that he developed over time? We know that Joshua was 110 years old when he died. Aiden read that for us just a few minutes ago. We know that the conquest of Canaan was going to be a long time in Joshua um, 24, 20, I'm sorry, Joshua eleven eighteen. 18, Joshua made war a long time with those kings. Caleb gives us some type of time frame as to uh, how long this took. Caleb says that he was, Caleb said that he was 40 years old when he went to spy out the land. He was kept alive these 45 years in the wilderness. And at that current time, he was 85 years old. And, the, and we know the process of the conquest of Canaan is going to be slow. Little by little, read that in Exodus 23 Verses 27 and 30. And we have this from Josephus. So Joshua, and we had thus discoursed of them, died, having lived 110 years, 40 of which he lived with Moses, in order to learn what he might be for his advantage afterwards. He also became their commander after his death for 25 years. I'm not known for my math skills. So let's just roll through this here real quick. So he lived with Moses 40, commander for 25, 65. We're good right there, right? 110 minus 65, so he would have been 45-ish at the Exodus. So it's kind of interesting what, what Josephus says about uh, the Joshua, right? In order that he might learn, in order to learn what might be for his advantage afterwards. Interesting, interesting point there. <clears throat> what did Joshua see and learn during those 45 years in Egyptian captivity and those 40 years with Moses? No question he learned about things to do, but I wonder if he learned about things or learned about not to do things. See, I'm, I'm of this mind that every day you're educating people in some way, some, some form. You can educate them on things to do or things not to do. So for me, I have to be aware of the lesson that I'm teaching each and every day. But there's, but there's some discussion on on if Joshua was a developed leader. And we also have this in Numbers, Numbers 27, verse 18. So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua the son of Nun, a man who lived in whom is the Spirit, to lay hands on him. NIV will say the spirit of leadership. So, was he a natural born leader or a developed leader? It is an interesting discussion. And uh, no matter where, what train of thought you kind of hit your wagon to, it's not going to really bear any... any it's going to mean anything about what we talked about for the remainder of this lesson. These are just some observations, some leadership observations from Joshua that I kind of picked up on. These are totally, totally mine. You may not agree with these, and I, I understand I'm not going to tell you just because I have this on, you have to listen to me. You don't. You can check out anytime you want to. Some of you may check out. Some of you may have already checked out. Uh, all, as I, all I ask is that you consider them as we move, we move forward in this lesson. See, we know about Joshua's faith. We know about his obedience, his desire to please God. What else can I learn from him? What else can I take away from the life of Joshua? Joshua explained the why. After he is commissioned by God to lead the people, Joshua gathers all the officers to the camp, said, in three days we're going to take possession of the land. Everybody get ready. We're going over to see this land. And chapters, we'll come back to chapter two in just a few moments. In chapters 3 and 4, we see everyone crossing over the Jordan River on the way to Jericho. In chapter 4, these 12 stones are taken up, and they're set up. I don't know how they were arranged. Not sure why, but what was the purpose of doing this? Why did they do this? Why did they set these stones up? Joshua explains. In Joshua 4, 19 through 24, And the people come up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. And he said to the people of Israel, When your children ask your fathers, their fathers, in times to come, what do these stones mean? When your children, then you shall let your children know, Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground, for the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for you, for us until we passed over. So all the people of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. This is a memorial. This is a memorial for them to be reminded of what God has done for them, the promise that he had made so long ago. It's, an, it's reminiscent of a memorial that we will be celebrating or remembering in just a few moments, the Lord's Supper. Notice the language that Luke uses in Luke 22, verses 19 and 20. 
This is my body, which is given for you. This cup is out, poured out for you. A similar language, not, not a memorial, but who does baptism save? You. And notice again what Joshua said back in verse 23. The Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over. <clears throat> That's what a leader does, isn't it? He explains the why. They explain the why. So kids, when, you're, when your parents ask you to do things and you say, what you're going to say, why do I need to do this? They're going to explain to you that they, they do some of these things for you. Now, there's a lot of obedience that, that plays a role there. They want you to be obedient. That's why. If you can't be obedient to me, you can't be obedient to God. You can't be obedient to your bosses. Obedient plays a role in that. But it's likely if they're trying to get you to understand a concept or understand a, how to navigate this world, they're doing this for you. This is for you. Hopefully, you're fortunate enough to have a leader in your life, in your careers, that explain the why, why you do these things, most specifically how, how this why relates to you and your growth and your development. And hopefully, you'll carry that forward, that mentality forward in your, in your development as leaders for your family, as spiritual leaders, in your family, in your career. Leaders explain the why. <clears throat> Be strong and courageous. Back in chapter 1, the Lord tells Joshua to be strong and courageous like three times. Towards the end of chapter 5, they're about to go into battle with Jericho. When Joshua looked up, who did he see there? There's this man standing with his sword drawn. Now, I don't know what body language interpretation would be for back in this day, but if I saw a man with a gun drawn today, I would not think that he's here just to chat. I would think that he means, uh, has other intentions with a sword drawn. I figure this is the same, same with this situation. But who goes up there and talks to this man? Joshua does. We read that Joshua goes up to inquire to him, what side are you on? He had like 40,000 battle-ready men who crossed over Jordan with him. He could have sent 100, 1,000, 20,000 people to check this guy out. Joshua went and inquired about this guy. Now, now, there probably were people behind him. Don't, don't get me wrong. I, I don't want to stretch it too much. But if you read about what kind of man Joshua was, he was very influential. People, people loved him. They followed him. So no doubt there's people behind him. But we just don't read that there. But Joshua was the first one to check it out. He had the courage to put himself in harm's way should there be any harm in this situation. As a leader, you're supposed to have courage to do, to do uncomfortable things, to... To put your life at risk, your career at risk, against the unknown. In, in the military circles, they, they look for people who, who will run towards the gunfire and not from it. Leaders have to be courageous. Leaders have to have the strength to deal with hard decisions. Prior to the defeat of Jericho, Joshua instructs the warriors to take nothing from themselves for the spoils of war, to destroy everything besides Rahab and her family. When those instructions were not followed, this brought trouble on Israel in their next battle with Ai, causing them to lose the battle and causing the people to lose courage. Joshua is given this task to remove this person who, who, who took the devoted things by fire. When Achan is brought before Joshua, Achan does fess up, give him, give, give him some credit there. And I wish we had more to this scene. <clears throat> Just I wonder how thick the tension was. I tend to see in pictures and try to try to guess the attitudes and in the, in the, in what's going on in this, this scene right here. When it took the time for the messengers to go to Aiken's tent and come back, what kind of conversations were taking place there? Was it just was it quiet? Were there tears shed from Aiken or Joshua or anybody? What what was going on in this scene? We don't know all that, and I just I wish we had wish we had more. But we do know that Aiken. And his family were taken. We read that in, in Joshua 7, uh, 20, 24. And Joshua and all of Israel took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the cloak and the bar of gold, and his sons and daughters, and his oxen and donkeys and his sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said this, why did you bring trouble on us? And again, man, I wish we had the, the emotion behind this phrase. Was it one of defeat? Was it one of anger? Was it one of just... 
what, what was going on when Joshua said this. The Lord brings trouble on you today, and all of Israel stoned him with stones. They burned him with fire and stoned him with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. And the Lord turned him from his anger, from his burning anger. Therefore, to this day, the name of the place is called the Valley of Achor. Leaders sometimes have to have the strength to make hard decisions, make very difficult decisions. What Achan did affected everyone in the camp, not just him, not just his family, everyone. Something affects your team, your unit, your family. Leaders have to make hard decisions, and we see how Joshua handles it. He handles it quickly. It was prompt. There was no, let's, let's see if this blows over. Let's, let's see if we can just sweep this under the rug, and we'll, we'll address it later. He addresses it, and he addresses it quickly. <clears throat> Leaders have to make hard decisions sometimes. Joshua trusted his men, and they trusted him. Going back to chapter 2, when Joshua sent two spies into Jericho in chapter 2, we read that, that Rahab helped these men, and because of that, she requested um, that her and her family be spared. When they got back to, from this recon mission, they told Joshua everything that had happened. I'm not sure what they gained from a tactical perspective by going into the house of a woman of Rahab's profession, but we do know that Rahab knew the pulse, knew the morale of all the people in Jericho. Read with me in Joshua uh, 2, 8 through 11. <clears throat> Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to them, I know the Lord has given you the land and the fear has fallen upon us. And not all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord out of the water, the Red Sea, before you, and before you, and when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings, the Amorites, who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted. And there was no spirit left in any man in this city because of you. For the Lord your God in heaven, he is in heaven above and on the earth. Didn't matter what they gained tactically from going to see Rahab. God was with them. This is going to happen anyway. But no doubt this, this report pleased Joshua to hear that the people's hearts were, were the spirit was gone in them. They had no, no fight in them because of the fear they had. But this, this report that they brought back to them, this full report, had to include this oath that they made to Rahab. These men made to Rahab. We see in chapter 6, verse 17, And the city that is all within it shall be devoted to destruction. Only Rahab, the prostitute, all who were with her in her house still shall live because she hid the messengers whom she sent. And again in 22 to 25, but to the men who spied out the land, Joshua said, go into the prostitute's house and bring them out, at, bring out from there the woman and all who belong to her as you swore to her. So the young man who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brothers and all who belonged to her. They brought all the relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel, and they burned the city with fire and everything in it, all the silver and the gold and the vessels of bronze and of iron they put in the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rahab, the prostitute in her father's household, all belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spout Jericho. No doubt this, this trust was created because these men made this oath, and Joshua honored it with Rahab. Now, I, I know there's a larger, a larger picture here uh, of, of Rahab, a larger, larger layer to it. She's going to be, uh, Christ is going to be from her, her line. We read about that in Matthew 5, 6. She's also mentioned in Hebrews 11 as, as having faith. But I wonder if at the time this was happening, if all those players knew this, if everyone knew what, was going to, what they were going to be, what was going to come of them later in life, while these, these walls are falling down and this, this mayhem is happening all around, and did they realize, did they know what was going to happen through them? No more than Joseph knew what was going to happen through him when he was put in prison for being framed for something he didn't do. We don't know a whole lot about these two men. Some speculate about who it was, but Joshua trusted these guys to spy out the land in secret. It's something that I, that I missed that, that was, was pointed out to me as studying this. This is a secret mission. If you're going to send somebody on a secret mission, you're not just going to send anybody. Send somebody that you know, that you trust. <clears throat> Joshua could have had an alternate response to this oath that they made to Rahab. Look, I didn't authorize that. That's kind of on you. You know, if you said the blood's on you, if this doesn't happen... 
That's on you, but Joshua honored their oath. I don't think it's a stress to say they, they trusted in this, this man. Trust creates future leaders. Um, <clears throat> how true is this statement? As it well, infectious leadership has a ripple effect, capable leaders develop additional leaders. How true is this statement as it relates to this account of Joshua? In Judges 2, 6 through 7, read this. When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel, each went to his own inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done through Israel. It's impressive how infectious his leadership was. And this developed from leaders for some time after his death. Trust takes a long time to build and a moment to destroy. It can't be purchased back once it's lost. If your team knows and sees experiences that you have their back, for certain they'll have yours. It is the basis for any good relationship, no matter if it's a friendship, a, a, a marriage, a, a, a work relationship. Trust is not there. Then it's, it's, it's not going to succeed. <clears throat> Joshua kept his word and led with grace and mercy. So the Israelites were not supposed to make the entreaties with any of the people they were, were supposed to drive out. We read that in Exodus 34. <clears throat> don't, make, don't make a covenant with them lest they become a snare to you. So the Gibeonites made it look like they were from a faraway land. In verse 7, it makes it very clear of Joshua 9. They called them the Hivites or Hivites. So they had old wineskins, old bread, old clothes. This caused Joshua to make a covenant with them, and all the people swore to this covenant that Joshua made. At the end of three days, <clears throat> it was revealed that they had deceived Joshua and Israel. This caused a lot of issues in the camp. There was murmuring. All the congregation kind of mur murmured against the leaders, but the leaders said, we, we made a promise here. We made an oath. And Joshua asked them, why? Why'd you do this? Very similar to what Rahab had said, right? They feared for their lives because of all they'd heard that happened with the other inhabitants of Canaan from the children of Israel. And they say this, Behold, we are in your hand, in verses 25 through 26 of Joshua 9. Whatever seems good and right in your sight to do to us, then do it. So he did this to them, delivered them out of the hands of the people of Israel, and they did not kill them. He made them servants. They had to work because of this covenant. Let's do what you seems right, good and right in your sight. So he did this. He did what was good and right in his sight by keeping this oath. <clears throat> not the leaders in the congregation um, who sworn by them to the Lord, the God of Israel, that we may not touch them. We will do this to them. Let them live. Lest wrath be upon us because of the oath that we swore to them. And the leaders said to them, let them live. So they became cutters of wood and drawers of water for all the congregation, just as the leaders said that they would. And Joshua backed them up. He backed them up on all this. And this, this oath, this, this choice had a lasting effect God kept this oath in mind. If you'll turn to first, 2 Samuel 21, 1 through 3. There was a famine in the land for three years. What was the reason? Now, there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. And David sought the face of the Lord, and the Lord said, There's blood get on Saul and on his house because he put the Gibeonites to death. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the people of Israel, but a remnant of the Amorites. Although the people of Israel had sworn to spare them, Saul had sought to strike them down in his zeal for people of Israel and of Judah. God remembered this oath many years down the road. And David cleaned this up, and God healed the land. <clears throat> What's also interesting uh, to me is that in the rebuilding process in Nehemiah 3, we see some people... Uh, come out from the Gibeonite uh, tribe in, in Nehemiah 3, 7. And the next them repaired, I'm going to slaughter this name, Melatia, the Gibeonite, and Jadon, the Meronothite, the men of Gibeon, and Mizpah, the seat of the governor of the providence. And it's, it's very interesting how this all came about by keeping an oath. Joshua kept the oath to the people. They kept an oath to him. We see him rebuilding a wall uh, of, of Jerusalem. So this ripple effect, you know, this, you don't know what kind of ripple effect you're going to have by keeping your oath and, and leading with grace and mercy. What kind of fruit will be, will be yielded from planting those seeds in the people that you interface with each and every day? The Gibeonites are supposed to be wiped out. We see them rebuilding the walls 
of Jerusalem. Leaders lead with truth, grace, and mercy, not because they are born to, because they learn to and choose to. Last point, and I'll, I'll sit down, Sam. I'm really, I'm really good at sitting down. I know I've done with the other three, but uh, I'm really good at sitting down. I brought this up in class last quarter, so um, I apologize for the redundancy of those of you who had to suffer through that the first time. Um, but leaders, leaders eat last. One thing that I never knew about Joshua that kind of stuck out to me is he got his inheritance last after everyone else did. In Joshua 19, 49 through 50, when they had finished distributing the several territories of the land of his inheritance, the people of Israel gave an inheritance among them to Joshua, the son of Nun. By the command of the Lord, they gave him the city that he asked, then Maserath, in the hill country of Ephraim. And he rebuilt that city and settled in it. There's no indication that Joshua took this by force. The people decided to let them have this land. Yes, it was a command from God. I'm just I'm persuaded that there was a driving force because of the man Joshua was that helped them, um, I don't know, encouraged them to do this as well, even though it was a command from God. There's a, there's a British uh, author, um, influential speaker named Simon Sinek. He, he wrote a book and uh, did a, a TED Talk about this, this topic. I haven't read the book or seen, seen the clip, but I've, I've got a snippet from this, uh, this article. It said, this practice is apparently mandated in the U.S. military. Frontline leaders eat first. Frontline, frontline soldiers eat first. Frontline leaders eat after them, et cetera, et cetera. When do generals eat? Only after everyone else is, has. Simon states that while this, is, this principle may come from the U.S. military, it is actually thousands of years old. Joshua didn't get his reward as a leader until the people he led got theirs. I'm not going to get mine until you get yours. Chapters 10 through 19, we have these accounts of conquests, of of, of kings defeated, and of the allotment of land given. This this seems very counterintuitive to today, right? It's probably why we don't see it very much, because it just doesn't make sense. Why Why would I let someone else I'm leading get theirs before I get mine? To me, it removes, it reveals what kind of character this guy had to have such a long-lasting effect on the people he led. Who wouldn't want to follow a leader like that? I was talking about, we, we are very blessed to be able to spend some time with Miss Carol, uh, taking her home back and forth, and others are as well. We were talking about this, and she said her ultimate, uh, she, she thinks Joshua is the ultimate family man. And that's a, it's a wonderful description. Is that, that word, family, it, it's thrown around pretty recklessly today in, in, in my mind. But Joshua understood the meaning, and he led his family to their inheritance. And his influence of leadership, it never stopped. Well, it did stop eventually, but it, it kept going for a long time. And he didn't stop leading until after the land was conquered. Even after the land was conquered, he led from where he lived. His influence even carried over after he was gone. So as we conclude, I appreciate your time this morning. There's, there's lots of lessons, lots of applications we can learn from Joshua, but none are more important than his obedience to God. From his time with Moses, <clears throat> he was given the command to lead, lead the children of Israel after Moses' death and living faithful unto death. It's what Joshua, Joshua did, and his influence had a lasting effect for so long. Given the opportunity, Joshua made a choice to allow his faith in God to lead him so that he could lead others. This morning, you have that opportunity as well. What choice will you make? Let's find out. Pray it's the right one. Please come forward as together we stand and as we sing.